people return into church. We're grateful for your presence here this morning. Uh, we want to thank Peggy Schwacke for the special music we'll be enjoying later in the service today. And then once again, just want to um, extend the invitation uh, to everyone for Kelton Loomis's Eagle Scout ceremony, which will be here, uh, the Eagle Scout Corps to Honor, which will be here at 1 p.m. Uh, at the church today. Please stand as you are able for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished by Jesus, the worker of miracles. There is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us a whole people that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Please be seated. Good morning. I just like this may be a little out of order, but uh, we have guests today, Reverend Bauer and his wife Carol. Would you stand up, please, sir? former members of our church here. Thanks for coming and worshiping with us today. A reading from the book of Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Woe be to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds, who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up David, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We'll read Psalm 23 today responsibly by whole verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. A reading from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far, far off, have been brought, brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in the place of two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually 
into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. According to Mark, the sixth chapter, glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. My message today is uh, almost exclusively based on the second reading uh, from the letter to the Ephesians. Letters. We send them. We receive them. Maybe not as much sending and receiving as we did before email became a regular thing in our personal lives. But we get them. Over the course of our lives, we likely receive a few memorable letters, some very personal from a friend or a loved one, some very formal, likely from a business or a government agency, some containing good news, some containing not so good news, some containing surprises of one sort or another, and those are the letters that I tend to remember. But a letter that has become a staple of my interim ministry practice is the letter of call. A letter of call is the letter that comes from the church to a pastor calling that minister of word and sacrament to a specific pastoral ministry in a specific time and place. Most letters of call originate with a congregation, right? Sometimes two, occasionally three. Mine are a little different. Letters of call to interim ministry typically come from the Synod Council, and that's the case with this one. And I get a letter of call every time I change jobs, so I have a stack of these. But other than its source, whether it's from Synod Council or Congregation, this is the same kind of letter that you will eventually send when you call a new pastor to serve here at Zion Lutheran in West Union. Letters. There's such a thing as an open letter. We hear about those when a person of note or a collection of people write a letter and have it published openly on an, in a newspaper or online. The purpose of the letter is to address some kind of concern or issue. The letter to the Ephesians is an open letter and it's a good news letter. It's an open letter because it probably just wasn't intended for one specific place, even though it does say to the Ephesians in the first verse, uh, there are some of the original texts that don't have to the Ephesians, and scholars think that was meant to be widely circulated, um, not to be sent to just one specific city, as was the case with the letter to the Corinthians or the Galatians or the Romans. 
Again, scholars think that it was intended to be circulated widely. So it's an open letter. It's also a good news letter. It is written and circulated to Christians in Ephesus and lots of other places to announce the good news of what God has done in Christ Jesus. Last week, when we read from Ephesians, we heard the good news that we are blessed, we are chosen, we are redeemed, and we are forgiven. We heard the good news that we have an inheritance from God. This week, the good news is reconciliation. Quoting from our second reading, he has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access to one spirit in the Father. The good news is that we are reconciled. Reconciled to God and reconciled to each other through the cross of Christ. Reconciled so that we may know peace. Reconciled so that we might know the peace of Christ, the peace which passes, surpasses all understanding, to quote Paul in his very personal letter to the Philippians. And we are reconciled so that we may be at peace with one another. In the earliest days of the church, there were instances where the Jewish Christians kind of looked down on the non-Jewish or Gentile Christians. But that kind of flipped by the end of the first century, and this letter to the Ephesians and its wider audience is reminding those who were far off, once far off, the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, that they have been brought near so that both groups might be reconciled to one another, and that both groups may live together in peace in the same spirit-led community. Reconciliation. It's an ongoing task for the church, that spirit-led community. The members of the household of God often have, oftentimes have their dividing walls and, yes, their hostilities. Sometimes the dividing walls are tall and thick. Oftentimes they are more like a fence. Sometimes the hostilities feel like warfare. Oftentimes the hostilities are not so intense and they're hidden below the surface. We are, hopefully, coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic that still grips much of the world and which brought disease, death, and economic suffering to this nation. It challenged leaders in all corners of society, governments at all levels, businesses, the not-for-profit sector, and yes, even the church. The first few weeks of the pandemic are seared into my memory. We were fortunate because at the church that I was serving as interim pastor at the time, we managed just a couple weeks before we had to lock down, we managed to have some really exciting conversations where some 70 members and friends of the congregation came out for visioning night. The work that came out of that night gave the council enough information to begin to rough out a vision for the congregation's future. And it gave the call committee enough information to put together that famous ministry site profile you hear Doug talking about all the time um, and, uh, and prepare, prepare that document to look for a new pastor. But that was March 9. March 15, 16 was the following, the following weekend were the last services that I would lead that congregation in normal in-person worship. And when it became clear shortly after that that it was not safe to worship corporately, 
A few of us scrambled to put together an admittedly rough Zoom worship service for Sunday, March 23rd. At that time, we thought, wrongly, that we'd be back together by Easter. That didn't happen, and eventually we shifted, in the congregation where I was working, we shifted to worship on YouTube, which took advantage of a lot of the musical assets that that particular congregation had. Every congregation made different choices. How to worship, how to care for others, when and where to gather, what safeguards to put in place, when to return to corporate worship in some way, shape, or form. And it fell to leaders, usually pastors and congregation councils, to make difficult choices. And feelings got hurt everywhere. The feelings of leaders when they were critiqued, though they were working to do the right thing. The feelings of members when they were unable to gather in community, especially during a time when they needed community the most. And now, some healing is happening, but some wounds remain open, still in need of healing. The work of healing, the work of reconciliation, the work of peacemaking is the work that now confronts many faith communities. This on top of whatever else was stressing a community before the pandemic swept through it. So, members of the household of God here at Zion in West Union, what does that work look like here? What needs to happen for reconciliation and healing in this place? First, we can reflect. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need forgiveness from? Who or what have you been avoiding? Are you using online worship to stay connected to the congregation? or using online worship as a way of staying away? Who or what do you need to be moving forward? And what disappointments, hurts, fears, and anger do you need to let go of and give to God? First, reflection. Second, give it time. Some wounds heal quickly. Others are deep and need time to granulate. We do well to be patient for those who need time to make sense of things. The thing we need to avoid, however, is to let those wounds fester. And then eventually, conversations can be had. Conversations about the mission of and the vision for this congregation. Those conversations need some energy energy that may not be there yet understandably so we've been through a lot thinking about the future when we're just trying to get through the next month okay perfectly sense makes total sense but having said that conversations about mission and vision can themselves be energizing vision has a powerful effect on unity And at this stage of the interim process, those conversations likely can and probably should wait for new pastoral leadership. A great time to have those conversations at the beginning of a new ministry. Reflection, time for healing, time for coming together, focus on the mission. These all taken together make for reconciliation, which in turn, makes for peace. Peace in our hearts and peace in our relationships. And peace for this dwelling place of God. Amen.
Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. Tend your church, O God. Encourage bishops, pastors, and deacons in their proclamation of the gospel. Raise up new leaders and encourage those pursuing a call to ministry. Embolden all the baptized to embody your love and justice. Hear us, O God. Reconcile the nations, O God. Break down the dividing walls that make us strangers to one another and unite us as one human family. Equip leaders to deal wisely with conflict and guide diplomats who seek peaceful solutions. Hear us, O God. Heal your people, O God. Look with compassion on immigrants, exiles, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary, comfort to those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, especially Norma, Arnold, Jeanette, Roy, Brandy, Lois, Reverend Philip, Robert, Betty, Jax, and Betty. Hear us, O God. Nourish this congregation, O God. Prepare a table where we receive food for our hungering spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize our ministries of feeding and nurturing hungry neighbors. Hear us, O God. We lift these and all of our prayers to you, O God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with your neighbor. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. This is the uh, time of the service that we typically gather gifts and thanksgiving for God at presentation at the communion table. We're continuing, uh, at least for the foreseeable future, our practice of placing the offering plates uh, near the entrance of the worship space where you may leave your financial gifts. Uh, please know that you also may contribute by um, online or by mail. And again, just want to take this opportunity on behalf of of the congregational leadership to thank you for your support of and participation in the mission and ministry of this congregation.
Thank you, Vicki. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, we are going to try something a little different today. We're going to try today, uh, each side coming down at the same time. I'm going to be in the middle. I'm going to give bread to a person here, then bread to a person here. You go to the wine station on the side and then go back um, by the side aisle. Is that clear enough? Clear as mud? All right. Very good. Um, um, the bread, by the way, is gluten-free. I know it's really tasty bread, but it actually is gluten-free, so you got two for one on the bread here. Um, also, need to know that those of you who need grape juice, grape juice is in the center of the tray. Everything is red, but the grape juice is in the middle if you um, are in need of grape juice instead of wine. Um, I think that covers everything. If we could have the assisting ministers come forward. Uh, Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come to the table.
body of Christ given for you. The 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 blessing of Jesus be with you today and always. The body of Christ given for you. 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 given for you, the body of Christ 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 given for you. 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 The body of Christ given for you.
us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. And I forgot to do the blessing. I apologize. Uh, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Now you may be seated. And at this time, um, we have another update from uh, Doug Poppin, the chair of the uh, call committee, uh, to report on some, uh, I guess you can call it progress there. As Pastor was saying, it's an exciting time for the call committee right now because we get new letters. Uh, they are actually profiles of pastoral candidates, uh, and it's exciting letters because it makes us feel like the work that we put in so far, yes, there is someone out there that is going to provide us with our pastoral leadership in the years to come. Uh, the call committee got together this week and um, decided on two candidates. We read through and did some homework on each of the candidates, and um, we decided to move forward and do an interview with one candidate and not with the other. Um, I had this written out here that I just need to, I want to say the right things. Um, we decided to move forward with interviewing one candidate but not the other. We are excited about the candidate whose name and profile we were given, and we plan to interview the candidate in the next few weeks. And just a reminder that uh, this is a delicate time for everyone involved with the process. We like to keep you informed of what's going on, but at the same time we have to respect the wishes of those candidates who are putting their names out uh, for a call because we don't want to in any way jeopardize their relationship with their home congregations and the trust that they've built up. We don't know what's going to happen with that, but uh, we are hopeful that as the process moves forward, you will keep all of us in your prayers, and uh, we hope that as the process moves forward that we'll have more good news for you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Yes, you can have transparency, but also honor confidentiality. And one of the reasons for the confidentiality is the ELCA is a very small world. Word gets around this church. People are related to other people. Pastors move. I mean, just the combinations are endless. Anyway, that's the reason, one of the reasons why confidentiality is important um, in this process. So um, thank you, Doug, again, uh, for your transparency and keeping us updated. Um, I ask you to stand as you are able for the blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Speed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace. Singing, share our joy with all. Working for a world that's new. Faithful when we hear Christ's call. God of hope go with us every day to a world in need with news of joy and peace. May the God of justice speed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace, singing, share our joy with all. Go in peace, you are.
are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.